Issue 93 We start out with Sonic wishing he could get home for Christmas at Christmas Eve because he's stuck in New Tech in the Special Zone. So at least, this is definitely a change to the status quo. Uh, this is definitely a, this is a certain part of the comic's timeline plot point. Wait, how does this alien planet have Christmas too, in the exact same way? I guess Christmas was brought over from immigrants from Mobius, or vice versa. Then we see a random kid get given a Spider-Man rip-off costume and get bitten by a spider, and he thinks he has Spider-Man's powers as a result and jumps out of the window of his house, causing him to have to be rescued by Charmy B. Well then, I guess it's a great thing that Sonic let Charmy out of the hive. I'm really glad this random kid didn't get superpowers out of nowhere, because I was really dreading that the whole story would be about that when I don't care about him at all. I mean, maybe if he had a clear, deep personality, I would. After the kid is somehow still insistent that he's a superhero and asked to join the Chaotix, they get threatened by a giant called the Blazer, who back their lampshades at having laughable dialogue. Having random supervillains around for no reason makes the comic feel like too much of a generic superhero comic, which makes it hard for me to get invested, because there's no explanation for why these guys have their powers, and I can only assume it's because of magic overflow in the special zone. I can't imagine these guys living remotely normal lives. How would he get enough food to feed his giant body and so on? I guess that's why they're forced to be villains, to steal enough to take care of themselves. Maybe nobody will hire them out of fear, but that's never explained. The kid tries to prove himself and immediately gets rescued from a fire blast by Sonic, who uses his super speed to put out the fiery body of the blazer by smothering it with snow. Oh, wouldn't the fire just put out the snow right away? I don't know, I've never put snow over a fire, I guess it would help a little. Espio and Mighty attack him, and the kid naturally starts sobbing because he didn't get a chance to be a hero. Sonic shows a soft side again by telling him that there are safer ways to earn respect than risking his life, and tells him that he can help him and the Chaotix deliver presents to the hospital this afternoon. Uh, I think the kid would feel better if he got to do that charity work alone. His whole problem was that other people were hogging all the work. The story ends with the kid being given a can of flea spray from Sonic as a considerate way to keep him from having wild fantasies after being bitten. Does flea spray ward off spiders too? Cause it was spiders that caused his problem. Well that was pointless. Although, I did laugh at the, the kid at one point, so I guess that was charming. In the next story, the transformed alchemist Mr. Fry fights the mutated sharks that are attacking the pirate ship as the pirates are too afraid to fight them, and I had the biggest smile on my face because that was one of the weirdest sentences I ever typed. That's the Sonic franchise for you. He grabs the rigging for the main sail and falls, and someone complains that the sail had cost him a fortune. Oh, are you kidding me? Captain Plunder doesn't realize that Speckle and Mr. Fry are the same person? Granted, nobody's ever survived a walk the plank before, but still. He was blatantly told about transforming serum. How else would Mr. Fry have gotten to his ship? Because, because the transforming serum inconveniently wore off at the worst possible moment, Plunder isn't happy about how Simpson and the cat's fighting all alone. He breaks a window with his hook hand, grabs a hammer, and defeats the mutated sharks, proving that he cares about Simpson because otherwise he wouldn't have bothered helping him so early and just let him die. Simpson ends up being fine, and the sharks return to normal because the serum wore off. Plunder decides to cook the sharks, being pragmatic like that, and he tells Simpson to fetch the last crate of vintage rum ruffles he's been saving. It's kind of gutsy for them to even mention rum in the kids comic. Let me guess, they were eaten too and the useful transforming alchemist will be made to walk the plank again, even though he's clearly way more helpful than Simpson, whose magical powers didn't get to show up at all. Of course that happened, idiots. Seriously, like, I don't hate Simpson by any means. Uh, I feel like they ran out of good ideas with how his power of the old cartoon's powers could be useful, but it, it does make for charming visual gags, and I really do appreciate that. In the next story, we see Techno, Shortfuse, and Sonic and friends celebrating Christmas together. So it looks like Techno is a part of the group for the first time. Eggman complains about the citizens enjoying themselves without his say-so, and plans to have a satellite fire a heat ray into Happy Valley Zone, which will melt the snow and cause a fatal flood. I assumed that he wouldn't get to just press the button. A blinding white light appears, and a red-hooded Santa shows up with a snowflake staff. 
Okay, this is ridiculous. Santa shouldn't be in anything Sonic related. It's way too generic and mainstream. Even if the artist does try to make him look unique as possible. He asks if Eggman's lashing out just because no one sent him a Christmas card, as I wonder if Santa's just too cowardly to try to stop Eggman and inconvenience him with his warping powers, or maybe he knows that if he was risking his life, he might get killed and not be able to send presents to people anymore. But if he can teleport himself, you'd think he'd be able to teleport Eggman into a cage. He reveals that only living beings can see or hear him, and dismisses Eggman's robots as just machines. Honestly, no, but that's, that's not how it works for me. If they can talk, they're living beings. Although I guess because they don't have free will, they don't count. But they could be reprogrammed otherwise. Then Eggman can't touch him at all because his hand goes through him. Because people conveniently can't make physical contact with him when they're angry. They're going to completely forget about this power of his the next time that he shows up. Santa reminds Eggman way too late that he used to be a good man as Ovi Kentobor. Santa tells Eggman that he has the chance to do a good deed for Christmas by blowing up his evil satellite with a self-destruct code that- Why did he make that self-destruct code again? Was he worried that it would be sabotaged and aimed at him? By the time that would have happened, it would have already fired before he could stop it. Santa is really, really idealistic to try to convince Eggman to do this for peace of mind. Then Santa reveals he was just stalling to let Jorpius destroy Eggman's symbol of power. I guess he knew about Jorpius trying to do that. At least it's explained that Shorpies' sensors detected the weapon that was all the way up in space. Yeah, that's silly. Then Santa warns Eggman that if he follows the destructive path, his empire will fall within the next few months. Stop trying to patronize me. The writers would never let that happen, especially not permanently, because Eggman is the main villain of the games and Sega's favorite little darling next to Sonic. Why do they keep trying to foreshadow that happening? The, the, the story ends with Eggman feeling sad, realizing that he's got no friends on Christmas Day. This will lead to nothing. The first story was by Lou Stringer. It was a pointless but amusing story about Sonic saving a kid in the Special Zone who thinks he's got Spider-Man powers. And after defeating the Blazer who's just there to have a villain, Sonic convinces him to start doing charity work to be a hero in a safer way. But I have to wonder why this is working for him, because he was sad because he didn't get to do anything. And he's not bringing presents to the hospital alone. Either way, the Chaotix are hogging all the work. But I love how the story isn't all about the, the kid having unoriginal Spider-Man powers. I was scared for a second there. The second story was by Nigel Kitching and Richard Elson, and doesn't have the alchemist defeat the sharks because his serum wore off. Taking way longer to do so than it did for the sharks, who turn back to normal after Plunder has to deal with them with a hammer. And it ends with the pirates kicking out a valuable transforming alchemist from their crew because he ate some truffles from their hold. The final story was by Lou Stringer again and was pointless. Just having Santa show up in a Sonic comic idealistically wastes time trying to make Eggman be good and destroy a satellite, which he shouldn't be able to do logically, and then Shorpius destroys the satellite because he somehow detected it. When Santa already showed himself to be able to teleport and be invisible to robots and be untouchable to angry people. So one, he should really be fighting against Eggman and it's not explained why he doesn't. So with all of his magic, I want to blinked if he destroyed this death satellite. It's too generic having Santa around, but at least they did their best to make him unique and original with his powers and design. And I assume he's from a particularly magic-filled zone, explaining why his magic isn't out of place. The Fleetway Sonic Mobius seems to have the barriers between zones be much weaker because we constantly see people from other universes show up on Mobius. Like there's the Nameless Zone, and the Special Zone, and the zone that the damn Genie Gao is from. Though almost all of the star posts are destroyed by now. I should really stop calling one-shot stories pointless just because they don't lead to story arcs. I just happen to feel that way for some reason. 